Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Code Rate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at the Okibo Reckoner's gang leader, Grease Fang Okibo Boss. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see what precon upgrade from Streets of New Capanna we'll be covering first. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Grease Fang is a 4-3 rat pilot that costs 1, a white and a black, with the following ability. At the beginning of combat on your turn, return target vehicle card from your graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste. Return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of your next end step. Right out of the gate, we can see that Grease Fang possesses a relatively low CMC, an above average stat block for her cost, and a rather unique ability to reanimate vehicles from our graveyard to swing in with, then recurring them back to our hands afterwards. Breaking down her ability further, just like more traditional forms of reanimation, it allows us to cheat on vehicles' mana costs to get them into play much sooner than normal. And while yes, we do have to return it to our hand at the end of the turn, it's still a free reanimation effect each turn that also lets us take advantage of any ETB triggers we may have in play or that the vehicles themselves may possess. And should we rather keep the vehicle in our graveyard to be used again on the following turn, our color combination has access to a plethora of effects that allow us to sacrifice those vehicles for value, and then send them right back to the bin to be salvaged again next turn. So as we can see, Grease Fang is all about reanimating and replaying vehicles over and over again for value. Which is exactly why this build will be a vehicle-focused one that aims to enable her to do just that. Running both a garage worth of vehicles to ensure that she always has a ride at her disposal, as well as plenty of means to get them into our graveyard for her to salvage. On the vehicle side of things, we'll be including both high CMC low crew cost vehicles that we can cheat into play and crew easily, preferably with potent ETB and attack triggers for us to take advantage of, as well as more support focused vehicles that we can use to generate us even further value as we reanimate them over and over again. And on the graveyard setup side of things, we'll be running a decent number of means to tutor our best vehicles directly into our grave to be reanimated by our commander, various means to pitch them from our hands for value if we draw into them or when they're recurred back by Grease Fang's ability, as well as ways to sack them while they're on the field for value so they can be salvaged again. But while the main focus of the deck is certainly on vehicles, they can't do anything by themselves unless they have a crew to pilot them. So of course we'll be running a number of creatures to do just that, with a particular focus on creatures that can handle piloting higher crew cost vehicles more efficiently, and creatures who power up our vehicles in combat so they're even deadlier when they swing in. So let's strap in as Grease Fang is ready to unleash the full might of her Reckoners onto our foes. Too long has she seen her and her kind live in poverty as outcasts from the more civilized races just because they were Nezumi. They were treated like vermin, but now the streets of Tawashi belong to them. And with the blaring engines of their rides, they're more than willing to teach any upstarts why they own these streets, though those who cross them may not survive the lesson. So now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we have a pair of black entrants in the form of Crypt Breaker and Dockside Chef. Crypt Breaker is a 1-1 that lets us pay 1, a black, tap it and discard a card to create a 2-2 zombie token, in addition to letting us tap 3 untapped zombies we control to draw a card and lose a life. Making it a body that hits the board early, lets us dump our vehicles from our hand for our commander to salvage, creates pilots to crew said vehicles, and even eventually generates card advantage, all of which our build can certainly take advantage of. Dockside Chef is a 1-2 enchantment creature that lets us pay 1, a black, and sack an artifact or creature to draw a card, allowing us to get our vehicles into the bin directly from play in case we have no discard outlets available and giving us some nice repeatable card advantage as it does so. Then we close out this slot with Hotshot Mechanic, a 2-1 artifact creature whose power counts as too higher when crewing vehicles, allowing it to crew all but one of our vehicles all on its own, and again hitting our board relatively early to begin piloting them ASAP. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, some dedicated vehicle pilots join our ranks with Katsune Ace and Giant Ox. Katsune Ace is a 2-2 that, whenever a vehicle attacks, either grants that vehicle first strike until end of turn or untaps itself. It's AoE first strike granting, making our vehicles very tricky to block by our opponents on offense, while its ability to untap itself to pilot vehicles on defense is a nice bonus. Giant Ox is a 0-6 that crews vehicles with its toughness, its ability allowing it to pilot even our most crew intensive vehicles with ease and in the meantime serving as a sturdy blocker to intercept attacks. Then a pair of discard sources join our ranks with Pack Rats and Seasoned Hallow Blade. Pack Rats is a star star rat whose power and toughness is equal to the number of rats we control, and lets us pay 2, a black, and discard a card to create a token copy of it, making it a 2-2 with just it and our commander in play that keeps multiplying and getting bigger as we use it to fill our graveyard up with vehicles. 
Seasoned Hallow Blade is a 3-1 that lets us tap it and discard a card to make it indestructible until end of turn. Serving as a free discard outlet for our vehicles while also being quite sturdy and capable of piloting them with its respectable power. Then we close out this slot with a pair of legendaries, those being Shram Senior Edificer and Oswald Fiddlebender. Shram is a 2-2 that draws us a card whenever we cast a vehicle, aura, or equipment spell, making him an easy-to-trigger repeatable source of card advantage for our vehicle heavy build. Oswald is another 2-2 that, at sorcery speed, lets us pay a white, tap him, and sack an artifact to search our deck for another artifact of CMC1 higher, then putting that artifact into play. Working nicely alongside our commander to turn our temporarily reanimated vehicles into permanent upgraded ones for the cost of only a single mana. Proceeding to the CMC3 slot, we have a pair of artifact-focused creatures with Digsight Engineer and Lashiel Clockwork Scholar. Digsight Engineer is a 3-3 that, whenever we cast an artifact spell, lets us pay 2 to create a 0-0 artifact construct creature token who gains plus 1 plus 1 for each artifact we control, providing us with another source of tokens to crew our vehicles, which eventually become legitimate threats in their own right as we create more of them. The shield is a 2-4 that prevents all combat damage that would be dealt to attacking artifact creatures we control, and draws us a card whenever one or more artifact creatures ETB under our control, limited to once per turn. Sadly, not providing us too much draw since most of our artifacts are vehicles, but providing those vehicles with a one-sided fog effect whenever they swing in to make them even scarier in combat, which is a fair trade-off. A lone black entrant then joins this slot with Bog Witch, a 1-1 that we can pay a black, tap it, and discard a card to generate 3 black mana, serving as yet another discard outlet, but this one actually netting us mana as we use it to continue casting spells afterwards. Then we wrap up this slot with Foundry Inspector, a 3-2 that reduces the cost of all our artifacts by 1, providing all our vehicles with a decent cost reduction, while also being a decent enough pilot for most of them with its 3 power. Nearing the end now, the CMC4 slot kicks off with a trio of black entrants in the form of Auric Lore Mage, Violent Tumor, and King Makar the Gold Cursed. Auric Lore Mage is a 3-3 that we can tap to search our deck for any card and put it into our graveyard, gaining a plus one plus one counter if the card in question was an instant or sorcery, giving us a repeatable tutor to dump our best vehicles directly into our bin turn after turn, which makes it a near perfect setup for our commander. Violent Tumor is a 2-2 with Death Touch that, when it ETBs, lets us search our deck for any card and put it into our graveyard, being a faster source of graveyard setup than the previous entrant to enable Grease Fang even faster, while also providing a decent defensive body thanks to Death Touch to screen attacks with afterwards. King Makar is a 2-3 that, whenever he becomes untapped, lets us exile target creature and create a gold token, which we can tap and sack to generate a mana of any color, his ability making him quite possibly our very best pilot, as crewing vehicles will give us a way to safely tap him and get that exile-based removal and ramp he provides turn after turn. Then this slot closes out with Aeronaut Admiral, a 3-1 flyer that grants all our vehicles flying. The AoE evasion it provides our vehicles, allowing them to use their superior bulk to really hammer our opponent's life totals. And finally, skipping to the CMC6 slot and our last creature, we have Sun Titan, a 6-6 with Vigilance that, when it ETBs or attacks, puts a permanent of CMC value 3 or less from our graveyard back onto the battlefield, enabling us to permanently get back our smaller vehicles and creatures that were destroyed or sacked for value back into play, while also possessing an enormous stat block to use on both offense and defense. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we have a pair of removal options with Dispatch and Swords to Plowshares, both of which let us exile target creature, the former doing so if we control 3 plus artifacts, otherwise just tapping down that creature, and the latter letting the creature's controller gain life equal to its power, making them both their cheap exile based removal options that are worth running despite their drawbacks. Reaching the halfway mark now, the CMC2 slot brings us Deadly Dispute and Reckoner's Bargain, both of which let us sacrifice an artifact or creature to draw two, the former also creating a treasure while the latter gains us life equal to the sacked permanent CMC, each allowing us to turn our spare or temporary vehicles into card advantage and providing us with some additional upside to boot. D-Spark then joins us as another removal option, allowing us to exile target permanent of CMC4 or greater. Again, providing our build with some very cheap exile-based removal that, while it can't hit smaller threats, deals very well with a large variety of bigger ones. Finally, reaching the CMC3 slot, we have our last instant with Generous Gift, which destroys target permanent and gives its owner a 3-3 to replace it, making it a potent removal option that deals with a wide variety of threats despite its downside. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Jumping right into the CMC1 slot, we have its only member with Bone Shards, which has a sack a creature or discard a car to destroy target creature or planeswalker, giving us the means to both get our crewed vehicles and vehicles in our hand into the grave to be salvaged later, while providing us with some dirt cheap removal in the process. Continuing on to the CMC2 slot, we have its trio of entries with Unmarked Grave, Dam, and Rite of Oblivion. Unmarked Grave lets us search our deck for a non-legendary card, then puts it in our graveyard, making it a very efficient way to get most of our vehicles directly into the bin for Grease Fang to reanimate and, despite it not hitting our legendary vehicles, still adds a lot of consistency to the build. 
Dam destroys target creature, preventing it from regenerating, and has overload for 2 and double white. Serving as either a reasonably priced single target removal spell or a cheap board wipe depending on what the situation calls for, which is a good amount of flexibility to have. Rite of Oblivion has a sack a non-land permanent to exile target non-land permanent and has flashback for two a white and a black, providing us yet another way to keep our vehicles in the bin when temporarily reanimated by converting them into excellent removal spells twice per game. The CMC3 slot then brings us hit single entry with Morbid Curiosity, which lets us sacrifice an artifact or creature to draw cards equal to its CMC, this time allowing us to scrap our big temporarily reanimated vehicles to reload our hands and setting them up to be reanimated again on the following turn. Finally, skipping all the way to the CMC5 slot, we come to our last two sorceries with Final Parting and Tragic Arrogance. Final Parting has us search our deck for two cards, putting one into our grave and the other into our hand, allowing us to set up our graveyard and immediately bring up a card to take advantage of it or progress our game plan in another way, which makes it a near-perfect tutor for this build. Tragic Arrogance has us, for each player, choose an artifact, creature, enchantment, and planeswalker they control, then has them sack all other non-land permanents they control, making it a devastating wipe that can bypass most conventional forms of protection, and doesn't really impact us too badly as it allows us to keep Greasefang in one vehicle in play, which is often all we need to keep going. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. The CMC1 slot brings us the first of two entrants in this category, that being Okiba Reckoner Raid, a saga whose first two chapters have each opponent lose one life while we gain one life, and its last chapter transforming it into Nezumi Road Captain, a 2-2 enchantment creature with menace that grants all vehicles we control menace as well. Its two-time AoE drain being serviceable, but the body and AoE evasion it provides our vehicles are what make it worth running, especially for only a single mana. Then skipping to the CMC3 slot, we have our last enchantment with Tempered Steel, which gives all artifact creatures we control plus 2 plus 2, boosting our vehicle's already impressive stats even further to pressure the board even more with their increased bulk. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. The CMC1 slot brings us its only entry with Soul Ring, which we can tap for two colorless, providing our build with a huge amount of ramp outside of green to speed it up considerably, especially if we draw into it early. The CMC2 slot then adds even more mana rocks to our collection, starting with Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Orzhov Signet, which we can pay one and tap to generate both our colors, Talisman of Hierarchy, which we can tap for a colorless or either of our colors instead if we take a damage, and Mind Stone, which taps for a colorless and we can pay one, tap it, and sack it to draw a card, giving us a decent suite of mana generators to help grow our mana base in the early game. Shifting over from rocks to vehicles as we move deeper into this slot, we have Mokutai Soul Ripper, Colossal Plow, and High Speed Hover Bike. Mokutai Soul Ripper is a 4-3 with Crew 2 that, whenever it attacks, lets us sack another creature or artifact, giving it a plus 1 plus 1 counter and menace until end of turn if we do so, making it a cheap, easy to crew vehicle that only grows bigger over time as we sack our smaller or reanimated vehicles to it turn after turn. Colossal Plow is a 6-3 with Crew 6 that, whenever it attacks, generates 3 white mana, gains us 3 life, and prevents us from losing mana until the end of the turn. It's high crew cost requiring a bit of setup to get online, but the ramp, life gain, and high power it provides making it well worth running as it will often trade up and go to the bin to be used again on following turns. High Speed Hover Bike is a 2-2 with Flash and Crew 1 that, when it ETBs, taps up to one target creature, giving us an on-demand source of tap down that we have easy access to from the Graver Hand to use over and over again, which can make blocking our creatures or attacking us a bit more awkward for our opponents. Three more vehicles are then added to our arsenal with Smuggler's Copter, Mecha Titan Core, and Reckoner Bank Buster. Smuggler's Copter is a 3-3 flyer with Crew 1 that, when it attacks or blocks, lets us draw a card and discard a card. It's on attack and blocking loot effect allowing us to efficiently fill up our graveyard with vehicles, which is made even easier by its cheap crew cost and built-in evasion to get attacks in safely. Mecha Titan Core is a 2-4 with Crew 2 that lets us pay 5, tap it, and exile it along with 4 other artifact creatures and or vehicles to create Mecha Titan. A 10-10 artifact construct creature token with Flying, Vigilance, Trample, Lifelink, and Haste that's all colors, and, when it leaves the field, returns all cards exiled by it back into play tapped except for Mecha Titan Core, dropping relatively early and enabling us to pool our smaller vehicles together to create a terrifying beat stick, or alternatively using it to protect 4 of our other vehicles from a board wipe if we have the open mana. Reckoner Bank Buster is a 4-4 with Crew 3 that comes into play with three charge counters on it and lets us pay two, tap it, and remove a charge counter from it to draw a card, also creating a 1-1 pilot whose power is too higher when crewing vehicles and a treasure token if the last counter is removed this way, making it a respectable body that gives us additional card draw, pilots, and ramp over time, which this build can certainly put to use. Then we end this slot with Key to the City, which lets us tap it and discard a card to make target creature unblockable until end of turn, and, when it untaps, lets us pay two to draw a card, providing us with a manaless way to scrap our vehicles from our hand to enable cheeky attacks and giving us the option to replace the card we pitched on the following turn as a bonus. 
The CMC3 slot is in vehicles all the way down, starting off with some vehicle ramp sources in the form of Aerial Surveyor, Cultivator's Caravan, and Raider's Carve. Aerial Surveyor is a 3-4 flyer with Crew 2 that, whenever it attacks a player with more lands in play than us, lets us put a basic planes from our deck into play tapped, providing us with an easy-to-enable way to ramp turn after turn on an evasive and relatively well-statted body, which only gets better if we have an opponent in green that has access to land-based ramp. Cultivator's Caravan is a 5-5 with Crew 3 that we can tap for any color, effectively making it a mana rock that we can turn into a 5-5 body when needed, which is a nice option to have. Raider's Carve is a 4-4 with Crew 3 that, when it attacks, lets us look at the top card of our deck and lets us put it into play tapped if it's a land, providing us with the occasional additional land drop as it swings in and its biggest weakness of being blocked and killed after the first swing being largely mitigated by our commander, who can bring it right back into play on the following turn. Bombat Bazaar Barge then joins us as a source of card advantage, being a 5-5 with Crew 3 that draws us a card when it ETBs, easily turning into a repeatable source of card advantage if we can keep sending it to our bin from field or hand, which our build has plenty of ways to do. Three more vehicles then close out this slot, with Imperial Recovery Unit, Aether Sphere Harvester, and Peace Walker Colossus. Imperial Recovery Unit is a 3-4 with Crew 2 that, whenever it attacks, lets us return target creature or vehicle of CMC value 2 or less from our graveyard back to our hand. It's easy to trigger recursion, allowing us to get back our cheaper vehicles and pilots as we lose them throughout the course of the game. Aether Sphere Harvester is a 3-5 flyer with Crew 1 that, when it ETBs, generates 2 energy and lets us pay an energy to give it lifelink until end of turn. Its combination of flying and defensive stat block making it a solid blocker, as well as getting us 2 shots of life back to help stabilize our life total and possibly more if we're able to recur it or reanimate it. Peace Walker Colossus is a 6-6 with Crew 4 that lets us pay 1 in a white to have another target vehicle become an artifact creature until end of turn. Its massive stat block being fairly impactful in its own right, but its ability to bring our vehicles online even without pilots making it really shine in this build. Now entering the CMC4 slot, we have some glass cannon vehicles starting us off with Fleet Wheel Cruiser and Oval Chase Dragster, both of which have Trample and Haste, the former being a 5-3 with Crew 2 that becomes an artifact creature until end of turn when it ETBs, and the latter being a 6-1 with Crew 1. Each pack some heavy hitting offensive stat blocks that incentivize our opponents to block to get rid of them despite the trample, only for them to return right back into play on the following turn thanks to our commander. Then we have some more card advantage generating vehicles as we move into this slot's halfway mark with Conqueror's Galleon and Weatherlight. Conqueror's Galleon is a 2-10 with Crew 4 that, when it attacks, is exiled at the end of combat and returns into play transformed into Conqueror's Foothold, a land that taps for a colorless and either lets us pay 2 and tap it to draw 1 discard 1, pay 4 and tap it to draw a card, or pay 6 and tap it to return target card from our graveyard back to our hand. Its enormous toughness making it a very sturdy blocker, but its real value coming online after it transforms, in which it becomes a repeatable source of graveyard setup, card advantage, and recursion, all of which help our game plan considerably. Weatherlight is a 4-5 flyer with Crew 3 that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, has us look at the top 5 cards of our deck and lets us put a historic spell from among them into our hand while sending the rest to the bottom of the deck in a random order, giving us an easy and repeatable way to dig for our legendary creatures and vehicles turn after turn as we swing in with it. And our last vehicle addition in this slot is Search Hacker Mech, a 5-5 with Menace and Crew 4 that, when it ETBs, deals damage equal to twice the number of vehicles we control to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls, making it a decent vehicle payoff with its ETB removal and, since it's a vehicle itself we can get multiple uses out of if we keep getting it back from our grave over and over again. Then we close out this slot with Trading Post, which lets us pay 1 and tap it for one of the following effects. Discard a card to gain 4 life, pay a life to create a 0-1 GOAT token, sack a creature to return an artifact from our graveyard back to hand, or sack an artifact to draw a card, providing our build with additional discard, artifact sacking, and artifact recursion in an easy to use package to improve consistency. It's vehicles all the way down now for the remainder of our artifacts, with the CMC5 slot bringing us Aradara Express and Sky Sovereign Console Flagship. Aradara Express is an 8-6 with Menace and Crew 4. It's massive stat block and built-in evasion making it just good enough to run in order to 2-for-1 blockers or take chunks out of our opponent's life totals. Sky Sovereign is a 6-5 flyer with Crew 3 that, when it ETBs or attacks, deals 3 damage to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls, enabling it to deal an impressive amount of damage to creatures and walkers, especially on the turn it's reanimated, and its bulk and built-in evasion making it a potent threat to stick on the battlefield instead if we would rather focus on reanimating other targets. Skipping to the CMC7 slot, we have its only entry with Thundersteel Colossus, a 7-7 vehicle with Trample, Haste, and Crew 2, serving as a huge vehicle with a dirt cheap crew cost to reanimate early to cheat into play and later sticking on the battlefield permanently to continue piling on the damage. 
And finally, reaching the CMC-8 slot and our last and most powerful vehicle, we have Parhelion 2, a 5-5 with crew 4, flying, first strike and vigilance that, whenever it attacks, creates two 4-4 angel tokens with flying and vigilance that are also attacking. Being capable of dealing a staggering 13 damage over 3 evasive bodies per swing, and flooding the board with more and more evasive angel tokens turn after turn, making it the most valuable vehicle in our deck and one we'll need to prioritize to tutor for and reanimate to completely take over games. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our planeswalkers. Our only walker joins us in the CMC 6 slot, that being Ugin the Ineffable, who comes into play with 4 loyalty and has the following abilities. His passive reduces the cost of all our colorless spells by 2, his plus 1 has us look at the top card of our deck, then exile it, then creates a 2-2 colorless spirit token that, when it leaves the battlefield, lets us return that card back to our hand, and his minus 3 destroys target permanent that's one or more colors, providing a substantial discount for most of our vehicles and other artifacts, providing bodies to pilot them that turn into card advantage if removed, and removal that can target almost any permanent all of which make Ugin a powerhouse planeswalker to help fuel our build. That covers our planeswalker, so let's move on to our land base. Starting off with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Caves of Kolios, which taps for colorless or either of our colors instead if we take a damage, Tainted Field, which taps for colorless or either of our colors if we control a swamp, Concealed Courtyard, which comes into play tapped unless we control two or fewer lands and taps for either of our colors, Shine Shadow Snarl, which comes into play tapped unless we reveal a plains or swamp and taps for either of our colors, Temple of Silence, which comes into play tapped, taps for either of our colors and scries one when it ETBs, Goldmire Bridge, which is an artifact, is indestructible, comes into play tapped, and taps for either of our colors. And finally, Myriad Landscape, which comes into play tapped, taps for a colorless, and we can pay two, tap it, and sack it to put two of the same basic land from our deck into play tapped. Moving on to our utility lands, we start off with Bajuga Bog, Buried Ruin, and Gaia Reach Sanitarium. Bajuga Bog comes into play tapped, taps for a black, and, when it ETBs, exiles target player's graveyard, giving us some decent graveyard hate from the land slot to combat against other graveyard focused builds. Buried Ruined taps for a colorless, and we can pay two, tap it, and sack it to return target artifact from our grave back to hand, providing us with a land-based way to recur our artifacts if we don't have access to our commander. Gaia Reach Sanitarium also taps for a colorless and lets us pay two and tap it to have each player draw a card and discard a card. Its low-cost looting effect, despite being symmetrical, helping us much more than our opponents by letting us dump our vehicles into the bin to be reanimated. Mech Hanger then closes out this slot, which taps for a colorless or any color instead if we use it to pay for a pilot or vehicle spell, and lets us pay three and tap it to turn target vehicle into an artifact creature until end of turn, initially helping us fix our mana when casting our commander or colored vehicles, and later allowing us to bring our vehicles online even if we lack the crew to pilot them. Lastly, we're running 12 planes and 12 swamps as our basics to close out our land base. So now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 19 creatures including the commander, 6 instants, 7 sorceries, 2 enchantments, 29 artifacts, 1 planeswalker, and 36 lands. Taking a look at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 22 vehicles, 15 cards that care about vehicles, 6 cards that produce tokens capable of crewing vehicles, 13 cards that set up our graveyard from deck or hand, 8 cards that allow us to sacrifice vehicles and play for value, and 5 cards that allow us to reanimate or recur our vehicles, leaving us with a garage full of vehicles for our commander to crew and salvage, lots of cards that take advantage of those vehicles in various ways, plenty of ways to get them into our bin from both on and off our field, ways to generate extra bodies to pilot them, and a handful of extra sources of reanimation and recur to help supplement our commander when necessary. For general deck stats, we have 14 ramp sources, 12 card draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes, giving us a fairly typical ratio for our core stats with no real outliers. Looking at our mana curve, we have 8 1 drops, 23 2 drops, 14 3 drops, 11 4 drops, 4 5 drops, 2 6 drops, 1 7 drop, and 1 8 drop. Our curve being fairly aggressive to speed out our tutors and graveyard setup early, dumping our vehicles quickly into our bin so we can summon our commander and start cheating them into play ASAP. Currently, this deck is valued at 6505, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, Daredevil Dragster, Demolition Stomper, and Heart of Kirin all may be worth considering as additional vehicle entrants for the extra draw, raw power, or evasion they bring to the build. Born to Drive and Armed and Armored both make for good vehicle payoffs to make them larger or bring them all online to perform an Alpha Strike respectively. And Open the Vaults and Brilliant Restoration are great mass artifact reanimation spells to help us bring back all our vehicles permanently from the bin. For upgrades, Teleportation Circle, Conjurer's Closet, and Sundial of the Infinite all allow us to keep our reanimated vehicles via either flickering them or forcibly ending the turn while a triggers on the stack, while Inventor's Fair gives us some decent life gain and artifact tutoring from our land slot. 
But for the best upgrade, Entomb lets us, for only a single mana, put any card we want from our deck directly into our graveyard, making it a dirt cheap graveyard tutor with no downside. At least mana-wise, since we'll still have to pay some pretty steep funeral costs if we want to add it in. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Before we go any further, I'd first like to express my gratitude to the channel's subscribers for helping us crack the 3.6k milestone. Thank you all for your continued support, as this channel would be unable to grow without it. As some of you folks already know, there will be no poll this week since we'll be starting to cover the pre-con upgrade guides for Streets of Nuka Pena. And the very first one we'll be covering will be Maestro's Massacre and its face commander, the newly promoted crime boss of the Maestros, on Hello the Painter. But in the meantime, let me know in the comments below which commanders from the main set or from the commander precons you want to see in future polls. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank Sahir21 for their generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, Sahir21, and thanks for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cut-rate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one, folks, and stay safe.